Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Fredland, and we are sponsored, as always, by Running Aces Racetrack and Casino. And this is episode 123, and this will primarily be an interview with Sky Matsuhashi and actually having him break down a couple of hands for us, a couple of really interesting hands uh, that led to some really good dialogue uh, between him and the panel and some things that I'm still sort of sorting out. So uh, I'll be I'll be clipping us into that interview and that discussion uh, right after a couple of quick announcements, one of which is Crazy Like a Fox is off and running. At the time you're listening to this, we've already had our third out of our 10 sessions. There's still time to join in. If you want to join late, that's fine. I can get you access to the video for the first three, and you can join for the rest. Nice interactive Q&A discussions, uh, private discussion board, uh, homework, links, notes, all that kind of stuff, in addition to the video session. So good stuff, good turnout, some great conversation, and I think we're really learning some great things, uh, thanks to Chris Fox Wallace. Uh, also, Running Aces Player of the Week for last week, Daryl Windingstad, again, uh, uh, tops the Player of the Week uh, players. And the other three that received Tournament Lammers for their finish, Mike Dawkin, Glenn Catterlick, and myself. So another good week there on the felt. So with that, uh, let's join the conversation with Sky Matsuhashi from the Smart Poker Study. Here. Uh, welcome, everybody. We are here, as promised, with Sky Matsuhashi and a plethora of rec poker panel players here, uh, ready to grill Sky for all he's worth. Uh, but, Sky, why don't we just – I'll turn it over to you, and you can kind of walk us through these. I appreciate you being on again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate this time. So what I have, uh, the past two times I've been on with you here, we've done some cash games, right? Um, but I know that you are in your audience, a lot of MTTers, of course. Yep. So I picked two MTT hands right here. Um, actually, no, honestly, they might be sit and go as well. I, I can't remember. I just went through my tournament in Poker Tracker 4, my tournament database and found some hands. So this first hand is a nice suited connector. Everybody loves the Jack 10 suited, the 10, nine, the nine, eight, those kinds of hands. So I figured I'd pick one of those here. Um, you can see the smart HUD is on the screen. Let me just make sure it's not covering up any of the action here. And, and this just, will, I guess, and we'll just, just reminder, Sky, a lot of our folks are audio only. So you're gonna have to kind of walk that line of video okay. and audio. So I know that gets a little bit awkward and the panelists feel free if you're recognizing something that uh, the audio-only listeners won't pick up on. Feel free to to chime in and clarify. So thanks, guy. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. So I am in uh, under the gun at a six max table right here. The blinds are currently fifteen thirty with a three chip ante. So after everybody antes in, the pot is a uh, sixty three chips right now. I currently have thirteen hundred chips, which is forty four big blinds. So I have a plenty big enough stack to do some three betting, some c betting, some calling c bets and stuff. You know, we're not super uh, super short stacked. Although some of the players at the table are short stacked, but we'll see who ends up being our opponent here. You know, so ten nine suited under the gun. I choose to open raise to three big blinds. I made it ninety chips. A fold, the cutoff calls, um, and everybody else folds. So it's me against the cutoff. I'm out of position under the gun. He's in the cutoff, like I said, and he made the call right here. So first off, what do you guys think about this uh, open raise under the gun? Is it the kind of thing that you would do? So we're, we're six max, so it's kind of like a middle position if we're a, at a full ring table, basically how, how I would look at that. Uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you guys think? 10-9 mm -hmm. suited. Well, I'd like to know... Um, what the other players are like. I mean, I got the HUD up here, but um, I can't really, this head, HUD is different than the others, so I can't tell how loose or aggressive or passive these guys are. And Absolutely. what would you be looking for, Rob? Would you be looking for sort of how, how frequent they three bet, or what would you be looking for if you had the information? Yeah, I'd be looking for people that aren't going to be real aggressive and three bet me off of my 910 under the gun. Yep, absolutely. So, so far, looking at the players, this stat right here in red, it's their three bet percentage right next to their name. And as you can see so far, um, 14 hands on most of the players. I have 53 on this one. Nobody has three bet yet at this table at all. So we're not going to, if we do face a three bet, it's likely going to be a stronger type of hand. So it's going to be pretty easy to get away or maybe call and assess on the flop if he's offering a good price. And if we look around at the HUD here, next to act right after me is a loose aggressive player at 43 slash 21. Now that's VPIP and PFR. VPIP 43% means he just plays 43% of hands, loves playing, 
PFR is preflop raise at 21% raises quite a lot of hands as well. So we have one loose aggressive here. Next player is um, loose passive at 40 slash zero. After 53 hands, he hasn't raised a single time. So mm -hmm. if he comes in for a raise, we can believe his raise most likely. But he's Next played 40% of the hands. What was that? He's played 40% of the hands, but hasn't yeah. raised a single one of them. Nope. All calls and all limps up to this okay. point, you know? Yeah. So if he does come in for a raise, simple fold right there. We lost three big blinds, you know, no big deal. Um, the next player is a 21 slash zero. So also very loose passive in the small blind and big blind. They both folded, but they're both kind of loose, aggressive players, but at least, you know, we lost all of them. So who we are up against in the cutoff is a very loose passive player right here. Let, let me ask you one, one question. The person to your direct left. So for me, the 10, nine suit, it is, uh, if I'm middle position, that's kind of right at the bottom of my opening range. Uh, and I think my ranges tend to be a little bit tighter than most. Uh, but I would look at the person on my direct left. They've got 25 bigs and they're kind of the aggressive player. So I mean, that would be the one thing I would think about is, you know, there seems like there's a higher likelihood that they could be, you know, even three bet shove and just kind of as a resteal uh, with that stack. I mean, how, how much do you consider that versus just saying, well, if it happens, I fold versus, you know, kind of spending a lot of mental energy thinking through every opponent, every possible situation, all of that. How much would that come into play? Uh, it would come into play if he was at 15 big blinds or less. Now, I know that there's plenty of players that shove at 25 big blinds and then 20 and people that love to shove at 18 or less, you know. Um, and But he is currently at 25. As you can see, yeah. my HUD displays everybody's big blind. So I don't have to do any math in my head. Bam, there it is. And at 25 big blinds, um, I'm... I'm willing to take the risk that he could possibly three bet or three bet shove over me. I just yeah. really think that when it comes to three bet stealing, like I said, it's often 15 big blinds. In right. So it's not a big concern, but that's a good point, Steve. Okay. Yeah, when you're raising under the gun, do you find that to be kind of like a button raise? It's something that is, that can be valuable if you don't overuse it then. No, I don't use this as a steal. I like 10-9 suited for its suitedness and connectedness. And I feel that I can get away from really ugly flops, especially if, I, if I'm able to flop second or third pair with a 10-9, but there's an ace, a king, a queen on the board, and my opponent is getting active, I can find folds here. I'm not the kind of player that stays in far too long with a mediocre hand. You know, So I, I'm fine playing this kind of hand out of position against some callers. Um, now, out of position against a three better, I'm more than likely, more likely than not, I'm going to be folding here. Okay. So yeah. it's more like but a value. I don't, it's to, more of a value. To, to get back to that thing. initial part of your question, I don't treat under the gun like the button. I'm not the kind of player that steals under the gun at all. No. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I know you didn't get three bet here, but just what, what sort of a, uh, you know, a lot of folks, you know, open and they don't like to fold to three bets. Like what sort of a three bet sizing would get you to fold this versus keeping you in with this sort of a hand out of position. Say, say it's probably, a, late, a late position, three bet. Yeah, probably anything at nine to 10 big blinds or, or bigger. So 270 to 300 chips right around there. Um, it would depend on the opponent, right? If these two guys, if one of them came in with a three bet, actually, even then I'd probably fold because they're three betting an under the gun player. If you just look at the overall situation, right. I'm raising under the gun. So far, I'm 14, 14. I've only played two out of 14 hands, most likely they probably view me as a tight player. My under the gun raise should scream strength to them. So if they're three betting me, they probably have a good hand I'm folding. Yep. So okay. Sky, what, what would change if this was a 10 handed table and you were still under the gun? Would you still, would you still play this if it was similar table style? Nope. I'd be folding. Okay. Yep, for sure. And especially, I'm, I'm suspecting most of my play lately has been sit and go. So I think this is probably a six max sit and go. I realize the value in sticking around for as long as you can and maintaining that chip stack in sit and goes. I try not to take really aggressive plays and really big chances. And if this was um, like a full ring sit and go, definitely folding the 10-9 suited because it's just not worth the risk. I'd rather keep my stack, let these other players knock each other out, and then look for opportunities, good opportunities in later position to enter the pot. Okay. But if you were middle position in a, in a full ring, would you open this? Oh, I would potentially, yeah. So, yeah, so like it really this is cut off hijack. This is yep. MP2, I think it would be. Yeah. Or just MP1, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would potentially... Well, yeah, if if at the full ring, these remaining five players were the exact same, yes, right. I would open then. Okay, yeah. yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. See, we don't let you get very far on hands. No, no, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> we're, we're craving this, man. We love this, so thank good, you. Good, good, good. 
All right, so we get one caller, heads up to the flop. The flop comes down three, four, deuce, rainbow. Uh, you know, I mean, he could have quite a few different hands that have some kind of draws here. He potentially has pairs for sets. But really, this is kind of a hard-to-hit board um, for a lot of calling ranges. Calling ranges have a lot of random aces, kings, queens, middle cards, like 10 jack, queen, nine, suited, that kind of stuff. This is not an easy board for him to hit at all. So what I end up doing is I throw out the one-half pot C bet, 243 in the pot, I bet 121, and he ends up calling right here. Now, he is a very loose passive player, like I said. His fold to C bet so far is 100%, or two out of two instances. So I was expecting a fold here, right? On a deuce three, four board, what, what's he gonna be calling with other than some kind of a pair? But he did end up calling. And then so, before we see the turn, what do you guys think about my C bet? And then what do you think we can kind of put him on once he makes this call? So you're not really betting this for value or a bluff in a sense. You're just sort of just range versus range. You just oh, don't no, it's a bluff. I, I want him to pull. Well, I mean, it's a bluff, but you're just kind of, it's kind of range versus range here, right? You're just, you're not really, you just think he's never going to connect with this board. Exactly. Yep. Connect with the board. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's demonstrated two out of two times folding to C-bets. I'm just kind of figuring he's folding a very good frequency. Makes my half pot bluff C-bet. Uh, probably it's profitable in the long run. You know, if I could make this a million times, I'd probably be profitable with it. And just so our listeners know, it's, it's, it's a rainbow board, but you don't even have back doors. It's, it missed your suit completely. Missed me completely. The best I can hope for is a runner, runner, 9-9 nine, nine, or 10-10 ten, ten for trips, you know? <laughs> right. Other guys, what are your thoughts on the C-bet? Well, I like the C-bet. I think, uh, you know, you talk about what he's calling with. I mean, I'd C-bet this every time. Rep you're representing a big hand to start with. Um, but what is he calling with? He could be calling with uh, a couple of overcards that happen to be suited and hit one of those suits. He could be calling with a pair of fives. Obviously, a set if he called with a small pair, but, you know, pocket fives would be there. Any ace, you know, now he's got a gut, he's got a gutter, so he could call with any of the aces that he might have called with. So there's a lot of hands still in his range. Yep, I agree with you there. Yeah, I mean, five, five, six gets there, of course, ace five. I mean, any of this, any of that kind of stuff gets there. Maybe a couple of overs. I think any, any pair uh, with maybe the exception of like sixes through nines or something, because just because I think they would probably raise you there. I think if they just flatted you pre, you'd, it, they probably re-raise you on the flop, something like that, sixes through nines, sixes through tens. I wouldn't think that he would. Maybe tens or higher, like ten jacks and queens yeah. that might. He's just shown, shown such a propensity to be passive and just a call. Uh, Pre-flop play often just bleeds into post-flop. So I just kind of doubt if he's not raising sixes or sevens pre-flop, I just don't think on a deuce three, four, hmm. he would be raising. He, he could potentially okay. be raising. And then great, my bluff is no good and I fold my hand which is a bummer. I don't want that to happen, but I just, I think he's probably going to be calling one or two streets with those small over pairs. Okay. Yeah. So is he, are you thinking maybe any suited ace, any suited six, um, you know, stuff that's going to give him a little gutter ball and maybe a backdoor flush draw then is that kind of where we're putting him at this point since he's not taking any aggression with you? Yep. Yep. I like those ideas right there. And I also like Rob, uh, how he said, uh, two over cards with a backdoor flush draw as well. Just like you said, Nels, um, it is Nels, right? Yes. Nice. Nice to meet you by the way. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. Yep. Cool. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, Rob and you, both of you. Yes, I agree with those. Those are the kinds of hands he could call with. And then a lot of the hands that he's folding are your random, you know, Jack nine offsuit and queen 10 suited that he could have called like queen 10 suited of uh, diamonds and there's no diamonds on the board. Oh, I have the 10 of diamonds, but you know what I mean? Right. All that stuff that kind of whiff, no backdoor stuff. Do you think he's re-raising sets here on kind of a wet board that you probably don't connect with very much? I mean, you're, it's a wet board, but you're not really connecting as a preflop razor very often with it. Do you think he's raising sets or just flatting sets? I think it's possible that he would raise, but more likely he would call at least for one street and assess on the turn because it's not, like you said, it doesn't have an ace on the board, which I have plenty of ace king, ace queen. It's not a king either where I have ace king, king, queen, where he could be getting tons of value. He might put me on like an ace 10 that totally whiffed on this board. Call one street. As soon as I check the turn, now he's got a bet for value. So mm -hmm. I don't expect a set to raise 100% at all. Any other assessments? 
No? Cool beans. So we uh, the pot is 485 chips, or roughly 16 big blinds now. Now the nine of hearts comes on the turn, making the board nine of hearts, three of hearts, four of clubs, deuce of spades. I got top pair, decent kicker with a 10, right? So now when we think about everything that he called with, all those hands that you guys mentioned pre-flop, sure, if he had a couple of hearts, now he picked up a flush draw. But this didn't make any kind of hand. It didn't complete a gutter, didn't complete an open ender. Um, if he had pocket nines, great. He has trips now. He has the case nines in his hands. But really, I'm thinking that this did not help him that much. And now that I hit a pair, an over pair to the board, it's probably a good time to double barrel to try to extract some value because he could potentially call like we said earlier, he might have five, sixes, and sevens in his range. He might have an ace for a gut shot, like Nels said, you know, that is willing to call one more street. So I throw out the half pot bet, again, exactly half pot, and he ends up calling right here. So what do you guys think of this? Hmm. Well, I think we kind of have to narrow him down a little bit. Um, I would assume, you know, if he's continuing, he's probably got some sort of straight draw, some sort of flush draw. Um, and again, I think we have to keep the aces and the sixes, you know, inside his range, but, uh, uh, beyond that, I, you know, I just don't feel like you're behind at this point. I yeah, agree I mean, with you. I, I think unless he, you know, I think he's flatting sets. I do think he's flatting sets. So I think those still have you beat, but I think he's probably going to re-raise just with it's getting a little bit, a little bit wetter with the hearts out there, but I think he still could have some sets. I think he could have stuff like ace nine of clubs ace nine of spades that he just got super sticky with on that flop with a gut shot two overs in the back for a flush draw or something like that where he he hit a nine um again i don't know why he wouldn't re-raise there but th those are the thing the hands that beat me but i still think you're probably ahead of a good chunk of his range cool yeah, i don't know don't, don't forget about five sixes sevens and eights right definitely in his range yeah, well, right. maybe a four or five <clears throat> Something like that where he's hit that four and also has the up and down. I guess that's also altogether possible as well. Yep. Yeah. Curious your thoughts, guy. This this is either a, a big mistake I make or or something, and I'm I'm completely transparent on how I play. But you know, I hit the turn and now I've got pair, and I think I'm probably good. But I, I tend to play a I try to play, especially fairly early on, a, a much more variance reduction style. And I know it saves me in a lot of cases, but also lose a lot of value in a lot of cases too. Um, you know, on a turn like this, I, I might be tempted just to check and I'm kind of checking for value in a sense, uh, hoping that they sense weakness and maybe bet, but I'm also betting for pot control, but obviously I'm opening myself up to getting outdrawn, you know, if they've got fives or sixes, that kind of thing. So what's your, how, how do you balance those sorts of pieces where it's like pot control, variance reduction, extracting value and, and protection? Um, I never think in terms of balance at the table. I try to always think in terms of what is my opponent doing and what is he capable of. If I look at this opponent, Jasmine 56, 40 slash zero, like I said, super loose passive over 53 hands. This person is a calling station. So since I just now hit a value hand right now, it's probably a good opportunity to bet again and hope that they still have some kind of a draw that did not just now complete. Obviously no draw completed, but I'm just, I'm just saying that uh, hopefully I'm still ahead. If, if, yeah. if, if he didn't have anything really good on the flop, he definitely doesn't have anything really good now on the turn. I'm probably still ahead. So it's time to get value. When you check against a calling station like this, you just miss out on, on an opportunity to get value. And if he ends up folding, great. I still won the pot. They don't get to see my hand at showdown. They don't know what I had for all night. For all they know, I had pocket nines right here. I had, I had pocket aces. I had pocket jacks, whatever. Um, so they have no idea how I play still. They've just seen me be aggressive on three different streets and maybe that can put them on edge and they think, oh my gosh, this wacky one guy is, is, is an aggressive maniac. Who knows what they think? But I think betting here has so many merits to it. Now, if I did not hit the nine and if an ace, a five, a six came on this turn, I'm probably checking. And as soon as he bets, I'm going to give up because I'm just looking at him loose passive in general bets or raises. I should give some respect to He's called three streets right now. I don't give much respect to calls, you know, blah, 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 over and over again. So I'm thinking my top pair is good. Um, so it's not an, an issue of balance. Like, oh, I should double barrel 60% and check 40%. I don't, I don't think in terms of that. My mind doesn't work that way. I like to see an opponent and attack the opponent. Got it. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Do you feel like your betting has to be more aggressive because you raised from under the gun in the first place? Uh, I mean, if yes, you had in made the, the same that... play from a later position, do you feel like maybe you could have been a little less aggressive? Is, does that pay at all? Or do you continue to keep your foot on the pedal as much as you have? Uh, I think I still keep my foot on the pedal given that I hit a nine. I just now hit a value hand against this calling station. Um, if I am in position against them and I completely whiffed the nine and then they checked, I would have to really think about what whatever turn card, how that affects their range. I expected them to fold on the flop because their fold to flop seabed is 100%, two out of two but they didn't fold. They called with something. They didn't call with absolutely nothing, right? They didn't call with a, with a King seven off suit, uh, most likely. So I've got to try to put them on a hand that would make the call on the turn or on the flop. Now that the turn card hit, if I think that didn't help them, I would double barrel, um, more often when I'm in position than out of position for sure. I hope I answered your question right there. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so this is, would you say this is a little more player dependent than, you know, the, or opponent dependent? Yes. The bet that you're making, the plays that you're making based on more on the player rather than your own position, or is it kind of a combination of both? It's a combination of both. It's, it's my position, the range that I'm repping. And I don't know, this player probably doesn't even think in terms of ranges, you know? The 40 slash zero. They just play so much. They want to see flops. They're probably not thinking about what I have. They just think about the likelihood or maybe they're not the likelihood. They're thinking about, Oh man, I hope I hit my gut shot with my King six right here. I want a five to come on the river. I mean, that could be as far as his thinking goes. Um, but I always, I do still try, even if they're not thinking it, I try to think in terms of my ranges. And I think by barreling from under the gun, it does, like you said, it's, it's, it, tells them I'm strong. Hopefully they pick up on the message if I didn't hit the nine and fold. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th- at this point then, because the nine is coming, he's still calling you. Do we eliminate some of the bigger ace hands and maybe leave in some of the smaller ones, ace two, ace three, ace four? Yes, I would say so. So by bigger ace hands, you mean like ace jack, ace, ace 10? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we could definitely eliminate those unless they have a couple of hearts. But if they were ace jack of clubs, ace 10 of spades, because it's two hearts on the board, there's no point in chasing those draws anymore. Um, He could be the kind of player that wants to chase to his two over cards. It's possible. But I would say a lot of those, especially if they were two like off suit hands that happen to call on the flop as well. Those are out of here on this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you which, still have which I don't mind at all. I mean, I have a value hand, and if he calls with ace jack and it goes check check on the river, I'm gaining more value. But I never look um, <coughs> uh, look a gift horse in the mouth is is the saying. So I never look a one pot. I never look down on a pot when I win it. You know, I could have gotten more value, sure, if I checked and he bluffed and I check raise or something. But you know, I don't care about what could have happened. I care about what happened. So if I bet here and I win the pot. Uh, that I'm, you know, I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm thinking all of his aces are still there because he still has that gutter. That's possible too. It's possible. You're right. Yep. And Sky Paul Havens texted in too. He just said he, he's never checking there like yourself uh, against a calling station. Uh, might even raise the value, uh, the bet up a little bit to like two ninety to try to squeak a bit more value. Even. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially because he called the flop when we expected him to fold. He does have something worth staying in. So I could have made this 300 chips, like 10 to big blinds or something. Like you said, like Paul just said, get more value. You're right. That is a possibility. Okay. All right. Should we move on? Let's do it. Okay. So the river comes a 10 of clubs. The final board is 10 of clubs, nine of hearts, three of hearts, four deuce. So the 10 gave me two pair. I have nine, 10 on the nine, 10 high board. Um, the pot is 969 chips total. So my hand just now got stronger. Um, and I'm not really scared of anything. Like we said, that didn't complete any kind of gut shot or open ender that he could have had. He probably doesn't even have I mean, he doesn't have pocket tens up until now. I think he probably would have raised at least on the turn. 
Um, so I don't think he has any sets. I think all sets, from my perspective, all sets would have raised on that turn to try to get extra value out of me who double barreled and raised pre-flop. So I'm thinking I have basically the nuts here. I can't envision anything that he beats me with other than an ace five or five six that he's just slow playing the whole time. Um, and then he wants to wake up on the river, which is possible. I guess trips too, but I just take those out of his range because I think trips would have raised on the turn with that, uh, uh, with that extra heart coming out. So I decided on this board, even though I only had 857 chips on a 969 chip pot, I wanted value. Shoving to a lot of passive players, it looks strong. It looks like, oh my gosh, this guy wants all my chips. Um, but if I make a smaller bet like this half pot, he's still left with some chips at the end, which could convince him to call with some kind of weird under pair fives or sixes in ace four, that kind of a thing. So I made the half pot bet. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I don't know as far as online, you know, when you're, when you're playing live, that just looks so fishy. It looks so value to not shove right there. But, you know, I guess this type of player, maybe he's not even paying that much attention or, you know, online, maybe you just think, well, he's just clicking half pot. Maybe I think you're not paying attention to your pot, you know, to your stack size. So maybe you don't read into it as much online. But I know live, uh, that would look extremely fishy to me. Gotcha. So, uh, but as far as betting it, I think I think at this point, yeah, you've got to bet. You've got top two. And if you're not worried about stuff, I'm still a little worried just because that's, that's my nature. I'm a risk management guy. Uh, <laughs> <Gotcha>. but, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think if, obviously if your nine is good, your 10-9 is golden. Yeah, and I think if I check, I just run the risk of him checking behind 98% of the time. And the 2% of the time when he has a set here, he's betting, you know. So I've got to bet for something. You're right. And, and Paul, Paul had texted in too. He said in this case, he might even do a little bit less again just to get value. Mm-hmm. Just trying to maximize mm-hmm. value to make sure you don't get a fold. Go ahead, yeah. Rob. Yeah, I think this guy's a calling station. So he's probably going to call any kind of bet with any, you know, any ace high, any of those pairs we talked about, you know, he's thinking that Sky could very easily be in there with ace, king, ace, queen, or he might not even be thinking what Sky might have and be just uh, calling with the strength of what he thinks his hand is. So, yeah, I think that's, I think you could go either way. You could, I, I like the fact that you're thinking about leaving him with some chips, giving him the ability to call without going broke. Whereas I think, like Steve mentioned, in a live setting, I'd, I'd probably just jam all in right there. Gotcha. If you jammed right here in a live setting, what would Jasmine call you with? Looking at this board, calling two streets, calling preflop, what could they call you? They could call me with uh, sixes, sevens, fives, eights, you know, because by jamming, it's like you're trying to push him off the pot. By betting small, it looks like value, and people in the live setting are more used to looking at that. They don't respect a jam as much as they do a a smaller bet. Mm, Gotcha. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Anybody else have any thoughts on that deal, either betting it or bet sizing? I'm assuming you're because he's so passive, you're not worried about him three-betting you on the river, so... Um, you know, assuming that happens, then your thinking is you're just, are you trying to just extract as much out of him as possible? So is that the max that you feel like he would be willing to pay you off? I think so right here. And also just continued. It was half pot each time, exactly half pot. And so I didn't adjust my bet sizing. I'm not upping it at all right here, which to me, when I lower it at this point, it could potentially get the value, get a call that would fold to half pot. But I think lowering it, like you said, Steve, even online, it does look uh, fishy is not the right word. It looks, uh, it's suspicious. You know what I mean? And then you would think that somebody has the nut. So I kept it with this half pot every single street in order to get him to call. Um, and I think it's possible. So he could, of course, shove with his sets and stuff, but maybe even some kind of weird, I don't, I don't, maybe a three, four now suddenly wakes up. No, I don't think so. I don't I don't think he would really shove with anything on the river, not even sets. I think he's probably playing it cautiously the whole time because there are players, we know them, they flop a set, they still play it cautiously until they turn that full house or they river that full house. That's when they step on the aggression. So if he has a set of deuces here, he might be worried, I have a set of nines and just call, 
you know? So I just don't think he's raising anything. I don't think he's raising me anything here. You so know, I'm Eric, not worried about it. Eric Anderson did ask, so what, what if he does jam here? Obviously, you, you know, you don't have much left to call uh, to it, but, but, you know, what if he does jam? Are you, do yeah. you just know you're beating you ever fold top two? Or do you just say, well, if he has ace, 10 of hearts and got crazy, or he's got three, four, I mean, what, what happens if he does jam here? Exactly. I don't think, um, I think it is possible he could jam with some kind of rivered 10, a king 10 or an ace 10, potentially. Um, so if he does jam here, I probably have to be good. I don't know. I, we can run the math, but like 12, 15% yeah, of the much. time, give or take. And yep. then so, I mean, I think there's at least a one in 10 chance that he could be jamming on me on the river. So far on the river, he's bet 40% of the time. If you look at his HUD, which is probably only two out of five. Yeah, two out of five. Um, but really, I think I would be, I've committed so many chips to this pot and I probably only have to be right 12, 15% that I'd be making the call right here. And I'd be just, I'd be bummed out. I wouldn't be happy making the call because I'm betting to get him to call me for value, leaving him with some stack behind. But yeah, to Eric's point there, um, I would be calling. Or to Eric's question, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Nice run out. Yeah, so, it worked out well for me. So it's a really, really good deck read by you. Really good deck read. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I don't know. So he ends up having an ace nine. Uh, so he caught me on the turn right there. Well, he had the better hand the entire yeah. time, you know. Um, he caught me on the turn, but then I just got lucky on the river. Uh, and if that wasn't a 10, if it was a king, a queen, an undercard, I probably still would have bet, and then he would have cracked me with the ace nine. But if it was an overcard, I probably would have checked, and he would have checked behind, and then we would have just seen showdown with my weaker uh, top pair hand. What if it's like a king and he you check, he bets? Are you going to call that off? I'm folding. Against this yep. player or just? Yeah, against this player. Of, right or here. just because of the action, because it's just been call, call, river well, aggression, regardless of who it is? One of the things I know, I recently made a video – uh, in my five minute poker coaching series on YouTube, all about when your opponent calls your double barrel C bet and then they bet the river. Yeah. I found in the databases that I looked at in my own database and then in my, uh, in my students database, that I looked through, he lost 21 out of 23 hands. If I remember right, when his opponents call the double barrel, then bet the river. So I'm just kind of playing the odds here just think about yourself. You know, when you call a double barrel, most likely you have a good kind of hand or you have a really good draw that completed on the river. I'm not going to miss out on value. So I'm going to bet as soon as my opponent checks, you know, or if I'm out of position, I'm going to bet because I don't want him to check behind. So in that database I saw for my student, 21 out of 23 times he lost when the person did that. So I would be folding here. I'm just so kind of playing the averages and, and looking at the situation. He's so loose passive. He bets on the river. He's got my second pair beat on the King so, High River. So that that uh, research, that's not necessarily player dependent, and that's probably just a, a standard betting pattern, right? When somebody calls two streets and then fires when it's checked to them on the river, you're going to be beat most of the time, regardless of player type. But yep. you're saying specifically with this player, it's almost 100%. Because I know a lot of the players I play in the live game, and I, I would say myself, I'm willing to do this as well. I'm willing to to float a couple of streets and then, you know, if, if I have sort of a six, seven hand or some, some garbagey hand here that never connects and they check, check river, I'm going to fire at that, you know, as, as a bluff. So there is, you know, obviously that does happen, but you're saying it with, in this case with that opponent, that's where it's a, a pretty easy fold for you. Exactly. Yeah. So that is a potential uh, bluff that p players do make. And if you ever catch somebody making that, definitely make a note on them. So if it happens in the future, you could just check call on that river, assuming you have something worthy of getting to showdown. But um, if you would if you would pay attention and look at your own database, how often you do this, oh, that's that was another thing. I flipped the script on this and I ran for that same student how often he calls the double barrel and then bets the river. And yeah. I can't remember the, main, the amount of times, but it was like 14 out of 15 or 14 out of 16. He did it with a value hand, you know? So okay. it was just interesting that he keeps double barreling and then calling rivers, losing all these pots, but then he doesn't realize that he does what his opponents do right there too. Mm -hmm. So like okay. you said just now, Steve, you might make that play as a bluff sometimes, but my guess is most of the time, if you call the double barrel, I mean, it might be like a, uh, an eight to two ratio, 80% of the time yeah. it's for value, 20% it's a bluff, you know? Yeah. And, and almost always checking river, checking back river. 
because yep. it's not a huge hand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Good stuff. Anything else on this one from you, Sky, or any of the other uh, panelists? No. Good. You want to you fire the second one up? Cool beans. Let's do it. Sweet. Thanks, man. Yep. So this one is an ace, 10 of clubs. Now we are at a full ring table right here. Um, I am in the, the hijack, so four to left, four left to act after me. I have 48 big blinds. The, the blinds are at 15 slash 30 right here, or 15, 30, I mean to say. So let's just see the action. It gets folded to me. So I'm once again in the hijack, ace, 10 of clubs, uh, four players yet to act. I have 48 big blinds. I throw out the three big blind raise. That's my standard raise um, in sit and goes and MTTs. I just always make it three big blinds. I find that when you make it two or two and a half, people are just too willing to call, especially when the antis kick in. So pre-ante, I kind of establish a pattern. Hey guys, I'm a three big blind better every time. And they just kind of come to expect it, I guess. Um, and it just works for me keeping the sizing the whole time with ace 10. Um, but once again, the cutoff calls <laughs> and then everyone else folds. So it's me out of position against a cutoff. Now, if we look at this player, Dr. Felt is his name. He's got basically a starting stack of 1,500, um, 50, 52 big blinds. I have 48. So we're roughly at 50 big blinds effective. He's an 18 slash nine, which is a tight aggressive player. But it's only 12 hands, so I can't put too much stock into that right now, you know. So before we see the flop, what do you guys think of this three big blind open cutoff call with ace-10 clubs? Feels pretty, pretty standard. standard. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you said, Rob? Pretty standard? I said standard. I think uh, we both said it at the same time. Yeah, and I, I'm still a, you know, I just keep contradicting, uh, looking like a fool on here. But I'm, I'm still more of a, you know, a two and a half X kind of guy. Um, which I and know that's fine. I mean, if, if that's what works for you, keep doing it. I'm not, uh, like, I don't know if it works for me. That's just what oh, I do. <laughs> okay, yeah. But no, I think, um, the interesting thing about that is I know maybe you shared this or, or somebody shared the Alex Fitzgerald study, uh, where he had one of his students start opening a 3.1, uh, compared to like two and a half or 2.8 or whatever they normally did. And like the percentage of folds just went up like 30% or something. It's mm-hmm. just some sort of crazy thing. It's almost like a psychological thing. So that, that bigger bet, you know, just, just gets more folds. It does. And it's like you said, it's a psychological thing because they've never seen anybody bet 99, uh, you know, open raise 99 chips every time at 1530. What is this guy doing? So they fold hoping to see showdown eventually to see what you have. But because everyone's folding, no one's going to see your showdown. They're not going to know if you have pocket deuces, five, seven offsuit, ace, 10 suited, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't share that with you, but I've heard that from Alex as well. And that seems like a pretty darn good plan. uh, uh, Confuse your opponents, you know? Um, I do have one question. Uh, if there is a limper in the pot, are you still making it 3X? No, I'm making it uh, five, six, or seven big blinds, especially when I have a pretty good size right here. One of the things I learned from Alex is, um, the same Alex Fitzgerald that Steve just mentioned, is uh, making it bigger versus a limp. So back in the day, or maybe still, the generally accepted strategy, the common bet size is three big blinds plus one per limper. So most people would make it four big blinds here. But what I learned from Alex is think about the player who just now limped in, right? He put one big blind in the pot. He wants to see the flop. Hopefully he's one of the weakest ones at the player. If you make your raise with the hand as good as ace 10, you make it up to six, seven, or eight big blinds and everyone folds and he calls with an ace deuce or a king five suited. You've just made theoretical buku bucks, you know, <laughs> against the guy. So sure. when it comes to isolating limpers, I always make it six, seven, or eight big blinds. It's often six or seven. And then if I have two or three limpers, it's seven, eight, or nine, you know, just depending on my hand and, and what I want to achieve with it. It's always interesting to me. So if you're, you know, if you're raised a six or seven, then you're, you know, you're, you're putting six or seven at risk to win two and a half. And so that's where the math sort of the, your, you know, your fold equity goes up, but your you know, the EV, is that, is that the right play? Is that the right amount, amount to risk? Uh, one of the other things I'd love to your thoughts on, and this is actually a, a note from Paul Havens. Uh, he said, you know, we'll get more folds from the big blind because pot odds are now wrong and it's hard to three bet a bigger size. It brings up to kind of that question of, of the three bet sizing. And I've heard it both ways. I've heard some, some pros, frankly, that'll say, I like, to, I like to open smaller to the 2.1 because then when I get three bet, you know, it's six or seven. Uh, versus opening to three when I get three bet it's like 10 you know so now I can enter more pots when it's three bet for a smaller sizing I'm kind of curious 
does, does that impact your, I mean, you have the standard three or, you know, now five, if it's our limper, you know, do you consider the three bet sizing and how that affects it, you know, based on your opening size? When I'm in position, my three bet sizing is always nine or nine to 10 to big blinds. Out right. of position, it's always 10 to 12. And the reason why is exactly what you said. I want to charge that guy who's raising small because he wants to see the flop for six or seven big blinds. Well, screw you, buddy. I'm making it nine, 10, 11, or 12 to charge you uh, to charge you to come in. You know, I'm making it more difficult for you to call. So yes, the interesting thing is those pros are right when they say that. Because most players just say, you know, oh, 2.5, 3x is seven and a half. And they're falling right into that pro's trap. Like that's what the pro wants. You know, they don't want to make it three and then pay nine or 10 to see the flop. So I make it nine or 10 regardless when I'm in position um, or out of position, like I said, 10 to 12, uh, in order to charge them what I think they should pay me to see the flop. And so is that pretty standard that you see other people doing that? Or do you see most people doing a multiple of the open? Most people do a multiple of the open, I'm, and I'm happy for that. So does that? So, but so that doesn't change how you open that initially. So that's you go three. I mean, potentially you could go two and a half, or you could go four, knowing that they're going to three bet a multiple. So knowing how the sizing of the three bets that you're going to be facing, does that change how you approach your opening size? Nope. I still make it three big blinds with the intent of, I'm always happy if I just take down the blinds. And if I make it three big blinds and everyone folds and one of the blinds calls, great. The pot is now at least six big blinds. I'm in position against them. So, and hopefully everyone else folds and it does isolate the weak passive player in the big blind, you know? So I'm making it three big blinds regardless. Occasionally from the earlier positions, I'll make it three and a half or four big blinds. If I have a lot of calling stations at the table, like we could see these two players are, uh, who are to my right, 24 slash six, 24, six, they're calling stations. Um, This guy's a 25 slash six. So if I had a lot of calling station, loose passive players in position on me, I'll make it bigger to charge them more to call. And if I make it four big blinds and I get three callers, then I'll probably end up just adjusting my ranges and not opening with hands that I don't want to go multi-way or making it even bigger to five or six big blinds. But that's rarely the case. Okay. Yeah. Well, last question for me before we get to the actual action. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the so the person on your left, the guy or the gal that just flatted you there, if they three bet you there and you've got ace, 10 of clubs out of position, what, what sort of sizing would you call there? Or would you ever consider a four bet? Or, you know, talk to me about how you respond to a three bet with ace, 10 of clubs out of position when you're starting the hand with like 50 bigs. Okay, if I don't know anything about this player like this one, 18 slash 9, looking tight, aggressive, the three bets at 25%, but that's only one out of four opportunities. It's not enough to go on to know that he three bets 25% of the time. I am simply folding right here. I'm not going to come over the top of the four bet. Um, I do four bet bluffing in cash games when I know my opponent, when I've seen them three bet bluff in this situation before. So if we open up, uh, if we take a look at the three bet pop-up that I have, um, you can see for this player, there's not, oh, let's go to this player instead. Okay. So this other player, I have 35 hands. I'm sorry. I have 74 hands against them. When my three bet pop-up opens up, you can see I have three bet by position. So as a total, small blind, big blind, and all the other positions, I can see how often they throw out those three bets. I can compare their three bet frequency with their calling frequency to give me idea, give me an idea if they use this position as a bluffing position. Sometimes you'll find players who love to three bet bluff out of the small blind, but they always call out of the big blind. So if this player three bet me from out of the small blind, then I could come over the top with a four bet or potentially call with a suited ace um, against him. You know, so it's player dependent. And in a situation like this, I don't know squat about this guy. He three bets me. I'm probably just going to fold right here and just go on to the next hand and learn from that lesson and maybe constrict my uh, open raising range or potentially make it bigger next time to see how he responds then again. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's, let's, we'll move forward. Sorry. I'm, I'm bogging us down. No, no worries. So good stuff. The flop comes down King 10, six with two clubs. I have the ace of clubs, 10 of clubs. So I've got the flush draw plus the second pair plus the ace over card, plus a backdoor straight draw. I've got a lot of stuff going for me right now. Um, The only thing going against me really is that I'm out of position against Dr. Felt. So the flop, I'm sorry, the pot is 225 chips. I make it 135, um, slightly over half pot. I guess maybe I click two thirds or something. I don't know exactly what this is, but it's roughly two thirds pot. Um, 
So I see bet with my pair plus flush draw and he ends up calling me. What do you think? I like the lead. I mean, I like the lead for value. I think at this point you're seeing, you know, there's a good chance that you could potentially get all your chips in on this sort of a, this sort of a board, depending on what comes. So I think it's time to start building a pot and it is, it's still fairly wet against you a little bit. I mean, obviously you've got the clubs covered, but you know, there's some straight draws out there, the queen nines, the ace queens, all that kind of stuff that you want to start getting some value from and make them pay for those draws, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? Well, he's, he's, his range is pretty well capped because he just called pre-flop. So, even you know, he's tight, tight, aggressive, did you say? So he's, he doesn't have aces. He doesn't have kings. Chances of him having tens is very, very minimal. He could possibly have sixes here. He could have a smaller flush draw. And like you say, he could have some of those hands that uh, um, are looking for a straight right here, like queen jack. Um, Jack nine, that type of hand. And he's got a lot of kings. He's got the king queens, king jacks, king tens, all that yeah. kind of stuff too. Yep. Uh, Paul Paul Haven says that uh, he likes a lead. A lead is good. He could have all the small pairs. He would probably re-raise right here with the set. With him calling, I think he has uh, a one pair hand, maybe a flush draw, maybe an open ender. Thanks, Paul. Yep, I agree with that for from both uh, Rob and Paul. Anyone else? How do you like my two third sizing? Is that good? Would you go less, more? Um, I kind of like it because I think it disguises the flush draw. Um, you know, if he's looking at that and looking at your bet size, he may not automatically assume that you're loading up with the nut flush draw on top of, you know, having paired the board. Um, you know, so I don't think he's putting you on a bluff here with that particular board. Uh, but I, you know, I, I guess I like the sizing. I'm assuming we're putting him on just about any any king, probably a big king, being he's a, a tighter player, um, or you know the queen jack. So I think the I think the bet size works great. Cool. We did have one question from Chris Jones about uh, <laughs> you can tell our, the interest of the rec poker nation so much because I say it all the time is what if we get re raised here. Depends on the sizing, but I might just come back over the top because um, this could be a scary board for me. Like from his perspective, it could be a scary board for me because I definitely have plenty of under pairs. I have random aces that did not hit just now. I've got a lot of stuff going against my range from his perspective, potentially. So he could use this as a really good time to come over the top with the raise, but I've got so much equity at this point. It, it would be really tough to fold. Now, if he jams on me, I'm probably folding here. But most likely, he's not going to come in for a jam. He's going to make it a min raise to 270 chips, maybe 350, maybe 400. And I think I can call all of those. If I think he has bluffs in that range, I could come over the, come over the top of the three bet here to put him to the test, you know, but really if he jams, I'm folding any other raise, most likely I'm calling or coming back over the top. I just yeah. like, I just, I just love the nut flush plus a pair oh, so yeah. much, you know? Yeah. And Eric, Eric made the point too. If, you know, if he does three, three bit, or if he does re raise you and you just call and then a club comes on the turn, your action might be killed. So there's a, there is an argument for getting chips in while he's willing to put chips in. True dat. Other thoughts, yeah. guys. Have we taken Ace King out of his range? I think so. I'm thinking in in tournaments, especially at 50 big blinds, everyone had basically full stacks right now. I mean, look look around the table. Everyone's got roughly 1,500. I think he's coming in with so many chips for a three bet pre flop. So I'm thinking he doesn't have Ace King. Plus, I have an Ace Blocker versus the Ace King as well. So there aren't too many in his range now, you know. And if it is Ace King, I guess it might be Ace King of what is it? Spades, Hearts. Or just the suited ones, just those three suited. Maybe all the off suits are folding right now, or folding pre flop and suited. There's three betting. Okay, if he, if you were talking about if he three if he raised you here, that you might go over the top of him. At that point, you're probably just pushing it all in, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, I would be at that point. Yeah, the stack size is the way they are. I agree. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because they'd be they'd go four hundred, and you have like twelve hundred back in back, you know. Right, mm-hmm. you've got you got yeah, you've got a regular raise just uh, just to go all in. Yep, yep, totally. All right, so whoops! Before we see that, let's yeah. go to the turn. For those so, of you watching on YouTube, you got a little bit of a teaser. Yep, yep. So uh, when he calls right here, there's five hundred chips in the pot after the call. The river, I'm sorry, river. The turn comes at king of hearts, making the board king, king, ten, six with two clubs. I have the ace, ten of clubs, pair plus flush draw still. And that top pair, I'm sorry, that top card just paired. So if he does have, like we said earlier, a king, queen, a king, jack, potentially a king, nine suited that might have called pre flop, um, he just tripped up on me, you know, which that's not fun. But plenty of those other hands those flush draws didn't hit anything the straight draws didn't hit anything a 10 that just didn't want to give up on the flop didn't hit anything either well his range now there's there's less combos of him having a king because of that <laughs> second king coming yep yep yeah exactly um so the king does come i check and then he bets 200 um <laughs> just trying to make a stab at the pot right here now if you just look at the odds the pot odds on uh, poker tracker four calculates to call the 200 chips i only need 22 percent equity um i don't really count one of the two remaining tens as an out because he could have a king and then it's just his full house beats my full house that's no good but i do have the nine flush draw outs flush card outs right here um for nine outs with eight, which is 18 percent equity you just you just double the outs to get roughly your equity in the pot so I have 18% equity. I need 22% to call. That's almost a break-even call. But look at that size of that bet. It's only 200 chips. It's less than half pot. He could totally be betting for value, or he could be betting as, as a really cheap bluff trying to get me to fold on a scare card. So I don't think folding is the is at all the best play here. I think calling is the best. I could come back over the top with a raise, but I just don't know enough about this player to know that he makes small bets as bluffs or anything. So I think for me, calling is the best play here. But I'm, I'm a little bit more interested in, in your check. You're checking mm-hmm. on the turn. Don't talk, yep. walk me through that. Well, probably at the time, I probably felt that he has plenty of kings in his range. And, you know, king, queen, king, jack, like I had just said. Um, and I did not hit my draw just now. And he's a tight, aggressive player. I just didn't think that this was a really good time. He called me on the turn after calling pre-flop. He does have kings in his range still. Sure, the second king coming eliminates some of those hands. But he still has trips in his range, plenty of those. Um, and then also, if he has any 10, I guess I'm currently beating those 10s, right? So if he does decide to bet, um, I'm check calling and getting value. So I think checking right here and avoiding the, I'm sorry. Yeah. Checking instead of betting and avoiding a big raise. I mean, if he put in just 250, a half pot bet, I'd probably be calling that as well right now, but anything bigger, two thirds, three quarter pot tells me that he has a King. He loves his hand and I'm folding right here. So I felt that this card was just really easy for me to make a decision based on his bet size. Uh, when the King pairs. Okay. So you're not necessarily, I mean, are are you thinking, you know, I really would like a check back here and get to the turn cheap, get to the river cheap? Well, that is what or, I'm thinking. Or yeah, definitely. Thinking, well, no, I mean that, that so that's your primary objective is to see a get to the river cheap versus uh in this spot you just don't ever see this as an underrepresenting your hand sort of giving giving a tight aggressive player a little bit of rope. You know, you bet flop, you know, he called you you check turn and you want to give them an opportunity to bet their 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 queen jack or their their seven, six suited or something like that. I mean, is that part of the consideration or is it really in this case, I just want to get to maybe, maybe I'll get lucky and get a check back and get to see a free river. That's what it is. It's what you said earlier on the prior hand, Steve, you're often thinking about, uh, you know, pot controlling and situations that just do not look good for a ton of value, or you just want to see that next card cheaply. That's what I want here. I want to see a river club super cheap is what I want. Because I know there's, I mean, there's, I think one of the facets that a lot of people don't take into consideration, and maybe I overemphasize it, uh, is just, you know, the, the underrepresentation of your hand, you know, by, by you're, you're so underrepresented here, in my opinion, I think even to Nell's point about leading out the flop, you're sort of disguising your flush draw. And I think by, by checking turn, I think you're sort of hiding your ace 10, the, the rank of the cards. So yeah, it is, there is a little bit of deception here, but, um, I don't really remember this hand playing, but thinking about how I normally think about hands, I'm not thinking that I'm deceiving him with a nut, fl- you know, with a nut flush draw. Uh, my goal is to see River cheaply, okay. like you said. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, uh, if you if you do hit your club on the river with a paired board, there are you going to be overly aggressive with this then? Um, what do you mean by overly aggressive? <laughs> like shove or half pot bet? Because if I hit my flush draw, what do you, so do you mean? Am I going to bet out or am I going to check and then call? What do you mean? Well, I overly guess overly aggressive. Well, I guess what I'm what I'm wanting to know is, you know, are how how uh, far in advance are you thinking this through? As far as you know, he has now bet this paired board, and and I understand the flatting that bet to to look for that flush draw. Um, how interested in this pot are you then at that point? I mean, how committed are you? If I hit the flush on the river, I am fully committed right now. His small bet tells me that he likely does not have a king. And even if I do hit the flush, that doesn't mean he has king 10 here for a full house. Or if the three of clubs come, he doesn't have to have the king three or the king six, right? He's got plenty of trips that can pay me off on my flush on the river. So I'm not necessarily going to put him on a full house if I do get the flush. So I am going to bet for value. Um, I don't know what that bet would be, but given that the pot is going to be 900 and I have a thousand behind, I'm probably going to make it roughly 400, 300 to 400 to try to get some value out of the guy. So what we're yes, hoping I am, for then, I am trying to think ahead to ahead to what I will be doing on the river if my card comes in or if it doesn't come in or if an ace comes in. What might I do on an ace right here? I'd probably be check calling on an ace. Okay, so what we're hoping for is a small club as opposed to you know as a club as opposed to a queen or a jack. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, anything else on on these? Well, I guess well, I let's. let's Go ahead, Rob. I think one thing that we didn't talk about on on the check is the fact that you don't want to get check raised off of the equity that you have in the hand right now. And that's really that's really the point of checking in that spot because you um you had a lot of equity on the on the flop and you saw where you're at, he called, and now you don't want to get in a situation where you get check raised and have or, to fold that equity. Or you mean just re-raised? Like if you lead out, you mean and he re-raises? Right. That's what I mean. That's why you check. You don't want to get re-raised and lose the equity that you have in that hand right now. Exactly. Yeah, you're right about that. So it kind of goes along the same way of just trying to get to the river as as cheap as I can, you know, and not risk too many chips. You're right. All righty. So let's go ahead and see. Before we see the river card, 900 in the pot. I have 1,000 behind. Basically, SPR, stack to pot ratio, is one right now. River comes the eight of clubs, which is a lovely card. Sure, he could have had a weird pocket eights up until now for just a rivered full house that beats me. But I got that club, uh, that club card that I wanted. Um, 900 in the pot. So I make a little 300 chip bet, hoping that he just pays me off with a 10 or maybe even, I don't know what, just a, a random king yeah. as well. And a king could shove right here. So I really think I would be calling if he does shove me at this point. Um, or shove against me, I mean to say. So what do you guys think about my 300, oh, one-third chip pot bet? I like it. I think I think a king jack, a king queen, any hand like that is going to – could get frisky and decide that, uh, well, that's a small bet. You're just probing a little bit. Um, your bet on the flop, like Nell said earlier, doesn't less necessarily think make him think that you have a flush drop. But so, when I bet the flop and then check the turn, does he kind of maybe put that idea back into his brain? Maybe. Oh, that you have a flush draw? Mm-hmm. Or that you had a you had exactly the hand you had, although it's not clubs. You know, you have an ace ten type of hand. Oh, there you go. And and uh his kings went ahead of you. Now now you get a little afraid, a little timid, and you you just check it back or you check into the on the turn. So now he's thinking his king is probably golden. Um, I don't yeah, know. Some people, some people get very aggressive with a flush draw. You're trying to do the semi-bluffs, you know, thinking, well, I'm going to try to bet this guy off the hand so that I, you know, I can realize my equity, blah, blah, blah. So Yeah, he could put you on, you know, even pocket aces, pocket queens, pocket jacks. You know, you slow down on that second king. And then, you know, if you don't put him on a flush draw, you're looking for some value or something like that too. Yep, I got you. I like those assessments. I like the size of it simply because on the turn when you checked, he bet 200. So so going just a little bit more than what he bet, 
gives him reason to, at the very least, call, if not come over the top of you. I yeah, you're right. He, he's going to have a hard time folding to just 300, huh? You're right. Right. And I don't think he's going to raise you if you, if you bet half the pot. Mm-hmm. Um, then he's more than likely just going to flat unless he has the king. Um, so I think 300 is good. It disguises what you've got, and it offers him an opportunity to give you more value. Yeah, I think that, I think the key for me is you know if you're betting it you know with the intention of what you know that that's as long as you're thinking that through, like I'm going to bet 300 with the intention of folding or the intention of calling, I think that's you know I think that's the key to that whole bet. And then you know if you're up against a super aggressive guy, you know like like Rob Washam or something like that, <laughs> you know, that's the only case where I would check just to give him a little bit of rope. You know, obviously with the intention of calling. <laughs> yep. But but yeah, I think for me that's been the biggest thing that I've tried to work on. It's just, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, but what's my plan if I do get shoved on? And I think as long as you kind of know, you know, as long as you kind of settle that in your mind beforehand, I think, you know, I think the, the bet size is great. Cool. Anyone else? If you're thinking of that you're ahead here, right? I mean, there's this couple of small potentials that, like you said, the pocket eights, that type of thing. Are you kind of hoping, are you trying to, almost bait him into coming over the top and getting the whole stack here? And and if you are, is 300 enough to do that? Or is it the best size? Or would 400 be closer to him going, um, I'm coming over the top of that? Or with 300, would he just go to six or 700? And, you know, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I understand. And I think a smaller bet would get him to do that. A smaller bet to like 200 or 250 would leave more chips behind, which would be kind of like, I'm bluffing the minimum amount right. that's going to leave me with a stack to still fold if he if he shoves. Mm. So I think if I really want to entice a shove, I probably could have made it less. Um, but I mean, basically, I he shows he's showed weakness on two streets, pre flop and on the flop, and then his tiny bet on the turn makes me think he doesn't have a great hand. Mm. Um, but it's not like I think he has a flush or a straight draw that's willing to come back over the top to try to bluff me off my hand. So I was betting strictly for value. If he does happen to shove, I'm happy to call right here. Um, but I was going for a call as opposed to a smaller bet that's easier to call with a 10 or, I don't know, with the pocket nines or something. That, you know, I wanted a bet that, that he would call hoping that he would win. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Jones kind of had that thought too. Is there any thought of betting smaller or checking to induce? Um, yeah, my question on that as a follow-up to Chris would be, and I, Sky, I'm sorry, we're, we're over our time limit, so I apologize. You feel free to cut us off here. But, um, you know, which, which is more, which do you find is more effective in inducing? Let's say you are, let's say there is no paired board. You have the absolute nuts. Uh, what, what's more effective in, in inducing, uh, you know, people to take a, take a stab on the river? Is it checking or is it this sort of a small bet where it gives them sort of the perception of you're weak and they have fold equity. I think checking uh, induces more bets, okay. if not shoves. I think so. But okay. I've never, to be honest, I've never actually like taken pen to paper and gone through my database to see what it is. Like I, like we talked on that prior example, calling yeah. turn C bets and then betting river. I've never done that. So that's just an initial gut feeling yep. I have. Yep. Well, should we have the big reveal? Totally. <laughs> King Queen. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So um, I'm. I was surprised when I saw this because I really think Trip Kings right there because that's a pretty wet board with a King Ten, lots of gut shots, open enders that I could have in my range. A couple of clubs. I'm thinking if if I was in his shoes um, with trips. On that turn, I am definitely betting bigger. I'm betting 300, 350 in that 500 chip pot. That's from my perspective. But he was, I'm, I guess, he was just trying to string me along, you know? Right, right. Yeah, but you, not, not me. I'm betting bigger for value. Um, yeah, you show like a little weakness guy, This frisky misky guy raised preflop and then C bet. Now I got trips. Maybe he has pocket queens that don't want to believe I have trips, you know? So I'm going for max value against him. Okay. Yeah, he and he just doesn't want you to fold any tens or any pocket sevens or pocket eights or whatever. So he's trying to get a little value there. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Which I don't, I don't fault him for that. But, but the board, the board is just so wet. I'm making yeah. it bigger. 
but he yeah. might have been worried that I had Ace King. You know, a lot of players they they for some reason Ace King's a really weird hand. Yeah. You often hear that in live games. I put you on Ace King, right. so I called. I knew you had Ace King. Yeah. You hear it all the time. So maybe he thinks I have Ace King. Yep. Interesting. Well, anything else on that on that hand, guys? I've already blown our time out of the water, Scott. And I do want to respect your time, so. No uh, any, worries, man. Well, to give it, give us a little bit of a, a plug in the smart poker study. What you got going on there? Anything new coming down the pike? And then we'll uh, we'll let you go. Absolutely. So something new coming down tomorrow's uh, podcast episode. I'm giving an April preview. What I'm doing for all of 2019 and probably from now on is I'm making every month one specific theme. So the theme for the month of April is the month of poker books. So. Uh, you'll hear it in tomorrow's podcast episode number 229. But uh, basically every episode this month, I'm going to be covering one book. I'm going to read one book per week, but I'm not reading in order to help myself learn the contents of the book. I'm reading in order to help the audience learn from that book. So most poker books, I don't know if you guys have ever read my books. Most poker books do not really tell you what to do. They give you strategies but they don't tell you how to practice your stuff on the felt. You know, my podcast, I give a challenge every week. My three books, I give play with purpose and study with purpose tasks. So what I'm going to do with each book that I read, I'm going to give the audience a play with purpose and a study with purpose task they, that they can do in chapter one and in chapter two and in chapter three. So if they go pick up the book for themselves, read through Tommy Angelo's strategy in his new book, Waiting for Straighters, you read that, but you don't know what you should practice, just go to my podcast on it. I'm going to tell you what you should practice for chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So I'm going to do that for four different books in April. So we do. That's awesome. And, and Eric Anderson asked if you're releasing a reading list uh, so they can read along with you, or is it just a matter of listening to the podcast? Uh, hmm. or do you the do next, know? the first book is going to be waiting for straighters, but I haven't really decided on the next three. So yeah. tell you what, Eric, when I do decide on them, okay, yes, I'll, I'll let you know in the next podcast, I'll give you a reading list so you can read them ahead of time for sure. Okay. Yeah. If, if you want, feel free to shoot that along by email to me too. And I can let our folks know, uh, uh, that as well. We'll do. Cool. And so, so book one is tomorrow? waiting for straighters. Okay. When you say tomorrow's podcast, that's April 2nd. April 2nd. Yes. Okay. Oh, Cause, Cause no, that's right. We'll, we'll release this on April 5th. So yeah. if you're, if you're listening to this or watching this, it is already out there, man, go listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much for that. And um, just two other plugs real quick. Smart Poker Study is the website, smartpokerstudy.com, or Smart Poker Study is the name of the podcast. You can search that in any of your podcast uh, podcatchers. And then, of course, on YouTube, Smart Poker Study as well. And that's where you'll find my whole series, 13 different videos I did on um, five-minute poker coaching. And I think Eric Anderson, the person that's been doing some chatting through you, Steve, I think I did a video on him. His might oh, be the right? video where the double barreling and then calling river. And I'm, wait, I'm waiting for him to show up on the chat here. Yeah. If um, I remember right, it might be his. Okay. Yeah. He said, yes, you did. Thank you, Sky. Mm. As, he, he also wanted me to uh, kind of what we were talking about before we came on online. You got your, that t-shirt on for your brother's business. You oh, gotta, that's right. You want to give the bro a shout out? Yeah, sure. My brother's name is Dusty. Uh, he founded masterpassiveincome.com and he founded it towards the end of, he was working for the Fresno County, um, just Fresno County office. And he was buying real estate, re real estate rental properties for residential homes. And he eventually had so many properties making so much money. He surpassed his monthly income or yearly income. And then he quit his job. He did master passive income. So now he teaches people how to uh, develop different income sources so they can quit their jobs as well. Sweet. Yep. So master passive income is it. He has a podcast, a website, all that jazz. You got to promote the guest brothers. I mean, there's just no way around this. Yep. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Thank Scott, you very well, much. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the bonus time. Uh, I'll, I'll let you go. You want you, uh, if you don't mind, stop sharing your screen and then you can sign out and we're going to keep the discussion rolling without you. That way we can talk all about you. Yep. Sounds good. That <laughs> works for me. All right. Thanks guy. All right. Thanks, thanks guys. Guy. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, what do you what do you think? Some good discussion. It's a lot of the stuff that we talk about on a week to week basis. It's just like reinforcing all of those thoughts that we keep uh, talking about. It's kind of interesting to to see it all play out again in another hand. Right. 
Let me uh, put a put a note out there. We've got four people that are attendees that are not yet panelists: uh, Doug, Eric, John, and Paul. Uh, if you guys just want to raise your hand out there, I will promote you to panelist. I don't want to force everybody to become a panelist. So if you guys want, uh, just raise your hand out there or put something in the chat, and I will promote you. Yeah. What else did you guys think? What are there any key takeaways there? I don't know. It, it, like I said, it was just a lot of the same types of things that we've been talking about. Um, when he when he checked the the turn on that second hand, it reminded me of some things that Brian Soja was talking about about uh, not wanting to get bet off your equity. Yeah. When you get a little bit of ec more equity than you had, you want to make sure you preserve that equity and not get bet off of it. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I thought that was interesting too. And I was trying to reconcile the two, you know, kind of, kind of the first hand kind of keep firing and the second hand checking it there. So, you know, that was sort of interesting to me. I've got to go back and, and work on that because it felt a little bit like the second one was kind of pot control underrepresenting your hand. And in the first case, he thought it was more appropriate to, to continue to bet as did most of the panelists. So I need to reconcile that one a little bit because that one's um, fluttering about in my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about it, they, there's two Kings on the board. Yep. And the guy, the guy called on the, on the flop, right? He called, he pro called pre called on the flop. Right. And then the second King comes out and now you're going, holy mackerel. And as we saw at the end, he actually did have a King. So in the pre in the previous hand, you know, you had top pair, then you got top two. I mean, you had no reason to slow down. Yeah. But on the turn, I still just had one pair and he had, he had done the same thing. <laughs> you know, he, he called me pre flop and he called me on the flop, you know, and, and on the turn I did, I did improve my hand, but I still just had, you know, one pair at that time, you know, and I, I, I don't, I'm not questioning his, his thoughts. I'm just trying to reconcile those two pieces of balancing, trying to get value and trying to, you know, reduce the variance. He also uh, mentioned that if uh, he had been raised on the turn, that he would have, he would have potentially folded. In the second hand? In the, in the first hand. Okay. Did he first, say that? Well, the second, like, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. He said that because the 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 opponent was very passive. Right. So if that opponent showed any aggression at all, he knew he was beat and he was going to get out. I think one of the things we have to look at between the sorry between <laughs> the two hands here, um, you know, the first hand he was playing from under the gun, and so he's playing from kind of a position of power, and so he continues to represent that. The second hand he's playing from the cutoff, so there's a little more. Uh, well, he has to understand that his range, right. according to other players, looks a little wider, so I think he has to be a little more careful. That and the player that he was playing in the second hand was a little tighter and uh, aggressive as opposed to the loose passive. So totally opposite you know, player types there. Um, so I think that, that uh, probably – is what makes the difference between the two hands and how they're played and how he reacts to their, their action. On the second hand, that smelled so much like he had a king to me that I would have shoved on the river and just said, okay, if I'm wrong, I'm, you know, if he has a full house, so be it. But no one else would have raised more than 300 there. I would have like totally said he, he, he raised on the turn. He's got a king. I just hit the nut flush. I win. And I'll I'll walk away happy if I if I do. I for sure would have bet bigger. I mean, he called two hundred on the turn with this flush draw. Um, I'm not sure like what percent equity he actually had versus the opponent's range, but then to only go for a value bet of three hundred on the river seemed um really passive to me. Where a lot of the hands that he would have the opponent would have raised sky on the river. He would have just gotten value from had he shoved like King queen in this example. Like uh, if he has a King, there's no guarantee he raises. And then if you bet bigger, you're almost always getting a call out of your opponent. So mm, right. I felt like a big size was uh, more merited there. 
Or even an inferior flush. Yeah, a lot now of I, things. I would say that off felt, and then I'd get on the felt, and I'd probably be passive. But just looking at that hand as it's playing out, I'm going, he's got a king. Do you so, think he gets called, though, by by 10s at all there? Do you think like a queen 10, ace 10, uh, you know, something like that calls him if, with a small bet? And I'm not saying you, know, you have to kind of figure out range versus range, but do you think there are hands that that would call the smaller bet that wouldn't call the shove? Yes, but I would still – I guess I play in smaller tournaments where people are willing to gamble more too, and I would have just – shove there and i'm pretty sure that guy has a king and would have called yeah i'm just trying to look at this whole scope of things you know if people do have an ace 10 or a jack 10 or a queen 10 and you know how, how much of their range that they've that they played this way would be willing to call a small bet on the river but wouldn't call the shove and how does that compare to the added value of those hands that you know will call any bet yeah and my mind if you bluff, you're going to want to bluff bigger anyways, too. So say you don't have the, the nut flesh there. I mean, you probably want to bet big if you're going to bluff at it. Any I'm not saying that we have an inferior like hand. I'm saying, that, I'm saying that they, they we have the hand that we have, but they have an inferior hand. You know what I mean? True. But, like, like, yeah, I'm thinking about it from the lens of, like, no matter what, we want the sizing okay. to be uh, kind of consistent through. Like, the small bet, it looks like a value bet. Yeah. It doesn't look like a bluff, and that's exactly what it is. Okay. So you're saying if we're bluffing, we should be going big. If we're if we're betting with the intention of calling a raise, we might as well get it in there. And if we think almost all of their range that's going to call 300 will call the full amount, all of those arguments lead toward a shove. Yeah, but I mean, it, you definitely have a point. Like there's going to be a wide part of his range, or I don't know how wide – but mm -hmm. a lot that doesn't call the all in or bigger bet, but does call the 300. Right. But if, you know, if you bet 600 and you get half of his range that would have called 300 to call you break even from an EV standpoint. Yeah, I just don't know win. what hands we have that can bluff a three flush board and a pair of Kings on the board. What are we going to bluff at there with a bigger range? What can you name a hand that you would bluff at that board with? Queen Jack. Mm -hmm. Queen Jack. You would just you would just bluff. Well, any anything that you played, anything that you played, right? That didn't. Yeah, I I don't think I'd bluff at that board. No, I I just don't think. I mean, would you, you're going to bluff large at it. I mean, you're going to get called by so much. I mean, you have Queen Jack. So what was he in the hand with? If you have Queen Jack. 10 a 10 a king the flush draw there's nothing else that he'd be in the hand with so you're bluffing at it with the hopes that he had a 10 because everything else is calling you potentially I mean, I don't I... Have anything else i mean at this time i think you're only value betting that river there's only value bet or fold i don't i think if the flush doesn't come he's just folding that river. he's just going to check fold it Even with the ten, I think he, I think Sky was thinking he's check folding the river um, on that, or check call a small bet if the guy bets small again, like a three hundred. But Paul, so isn't that an argument to bet bigger then, as it played out? If everything is going to call a larger bluff, maybe we should have bet bigger on the. Yeah, I, like, I don't. I didn't. I didn't like the small bet on the river. I would bet at least half pot on the river, but. He was leaving. He was betting three hundred to leave only seven hundred behind. So it looked like he had the possibility of folding if the guy wanted to come over the top. Um, if he just jams, he's jamming uh, three quarter pot, not quite the size of the pot. I don't think was it. I don't remember now. Nine hundred. I think yeah. it was a little over. So, yeah, it was oh, close. It was like a one it was a little over pot size bet. Yeah, it was close. So, so then it'd be tough to get called by anything but a king. He would have got called in this instance but I, I don't think you get called by anything but a king on that. Um, so that's... If you were bluffing, shoving... He wanted to get shoved on, and basically is, with that eight, that was a pretty safe card, and he wanted to get shoved on, but he didn't want to bet so little that he wasn't getting any value, so that's why he chose 300 over 200. Um, if you bet 400, you're only leaving 300 behind, 
it's kind of strange. Bat looks really strong already. You might as well jam at that point. But Stacy, are you saying so? Like, if you're only going to get called by a king, then if you are bluffing the river, that's that's what you want too, right? So if you're bluffing with with any of your hands at missed, or you're somehow turning like pocket eights into a bluff or whatever, and pocket sevens or something, then the bigger bet should get rid of anything but a king as well. Yeah, that's what I was just confused with Paul was saying there. He said, if it was if nothing's going to call you, then then a bluff is a good. A good move. Well, yeah, I think Paul's saying that there's not much that your opponent the has. Came, the flush came in too, though. So, I mean, you're getting called by any flush, any king. That's a lot of that's a lot of hands that could be calling that flop and then getting there on the river. It's a lot of hands. I mean, you're really trying to fold out a 10. And so that's an argument to shove if you did hit it. Like we did. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like either shove. I, I, I agree with his sizing a little bit too. Cause um, when you get to the river, I, I mean, I just got done uh, listening to Alex's book, the exploited play on live poker. When you get to the river, that's so many big blinds compared to pre-flop play that you want to get called on your hands. So even if you're only betting 300, but the blinds were only, you know, only uh, 2550 at the time or whatever they were. That's still six big blinds that you're not getting at, the, at another time. Um, I don't know what the blinds were on that that hand. Oh, they're they're fifteen thirty, right? So yeah, that's ten big blinds you're getting on the river. That if you just jam there and they fold, you don't get those ten big blinds, and you you lose that on your stack in a tournament play. In tournament play, it's all about preserving your stack and growing it as fast as you can. I mean, yeah, if you jam and he calls, you get a great hand, but you're risking the most for the, I mean, when you risk a little, people don't like calling jams in a tournament and looking dumb when they turn over their cards. They would rather call a small bet, pay you off, not show their cards and move on. So that's kind of the, the, the play of it is 10 big blinds on a river bet is worth stealing the pot 15 times when you're just raising pot preflop. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge bet. It's a huge amount of blinds you're getting in that one pot. Okay. Well, and he bet 300 on the river and the guy had the King and simply called him. I think if you jam here on the river, he, he may find a fold as hard yeah. to believe as that is. He was very conservative about, he pl- about how he played those trips. So yeah. I think betting for value there is definitely the way to go. He might have been able to extract a little bit more out of that, but I think uh, I like the 300 because there's always the possibility he may come over the top, and he was willing to call that. Right. Other thoughts on that one, guys? Or we can go uh, wherever you want to go. We just have like 10 or 15 minutes left here, so. Any, any burning questions on this stuff or other? He said something really interesting, at least it was to me anyway, and that was uh, when he was talking about pre-flop bet sizing. Um, and he said he used the phrase uh, to isolate the limpers. Um, so when you have someone limping in front of you and you decide to raise, he, he made mention of wanting to isolate that player. Um, and I guess I'd never really even considered that. You know, I I do add extra on to a pre-flop raise when there are limpers in front of me, but I never considered the possibility of just trying to isolate that player. I usually only think of isolating someone when they're all in and I've got a big hand. Um, so I thought that was a, a really interesting take on that whole thing and something that I need to evaluate a little bit more, maybe something we should talk over a little bit, because I think that might be a, a decent strategy. Mm-hmm. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Um, in that second hand, I would still argue that if they had an, a 10, they're probably just going to check the turn and get to showdown with it. The fact that they raised, at least against the players I play against at running aces, I would say that's almost 100% that they hit a king. And if I hit the nut flush, they're not folding. But they, they didn't raise the turn. They just, they just bet it once you checked. I mean, right. just, just just to be clear, that it's a no, exactly. But, but, but once they, they bet. 
right. When I check, if they have a 10, they're not going to raise there. I, I still think they're going to check. With just a 10? So just to be yeah. clear, the difference between betting and checking. So Correct. Yes. Uh, on, on the turn, you checked and, you know, we checked, right. uh, the hero checked and the villain bet versus, you know, we bet and they raised. Right. So just, just to be clear in the language there. So the, the see, fact that they put money in the pot on the turn when we checked, yeah. I think that they, ha they wouldn't do that with a 10. Maybe they, that's how different people play. See, I, I'm going to bet there. A okay, 10. okay. That's, that's where I would almost, and my gut was like, you, the only people I seem to play against would have hit a king there. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'd be curious what you guys do. So here's the situation. Let's flip it around. So uh, somebody opens whatever their fairly late position, whatever cutoff or hijack or something. They open, uh, I, I call with, let's just say, queen 10 of hearts or something. Uh, the flop comes, king 10, garbage. They bet, and I think they're going to bet, continuation bet quite a bit on that board. I've got queen 10. I've got second pair, so I call. Then a king comes on the turn, and they check to me. I'm going to bet that quite a bit because I think I'm good. Um, I don't know. There's there's plenty of times I'll just check that down for because I've showed on value. But in that case, I tend to think I'm good quite a bit. And if I, I bet my 10 there, then I also think if I get called, I'm probably going to see a free river, and I can go check, check on the river if I'm not comfortable. So that that's how I would play it, Doug. So I'm just saying. Yeah, no, that's that, just. Yeah. I tend to put I, I tend to put people on too good a hands, and I would have put them on a good hand there. Yeah, and well, I think it is a good hand. I've got a queen. I got kings and ten to the queen kicker. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but I see. What, I, I I totally get what you're saying. But I just or, think I'm betting well, queen there. Queen jack. They showed queen weak. jack. I could see raising there. If I had queen jack, I would raise because you got a lot of votes. If there was a king ten, and I don't think my opponent mm -hmm. has a. King. That's interesting, and I'd be more prone to put, to check there to try to see a free river card, see try to make oh. it the nuts. Yeah, interesting. What, I, what do you guys think? What do you guys? You're leaving me and Doug hanging out here. If I have called with you know like pocket sevens, eights, or nines, I may go ahead and float that flop and see what he does on the turn. Um, and if he checks to me on the turn, then I'm definitely going to bet that at that point because yeah. he's showing me the weakness that I want to see. Um, I think the the thing that we have to bear in mind in that situation, and when you do that, is if they go ahead and call you to see the the river, then you have to be a little more conscious of what does come out and what what the board does, um, and then make your decision there. You know, and in that case, maybe that's exactly what he did. I mean, definitely he was a lot stronger than what I was just talking about. But when he saw the the third club hit, he decided it was not worth coming over the top of him and just flatted, and you know took his loss right yeah interesting spot doug yeah that's just part of that is that's the interesting part like i i fall into this all the time you know i assume people are going to play the way that i play so when somebody bets that turn after i check i'm assuming they can have a lot of tens they probably don't have a king frankly or whatever and you're thinking kind of the opposite like they must have a king here yeah that's interesting well, that's just probably because i would only bet that if i had a king and exactly. i would check if i had a, if i had a 10 i would do pot control and just go i want to see the river and see what you do isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Well, guys, we're, we're at about time. Any other thoughts? Sorry, we spent most of the time, uh, you know, with Sky and kind of responding to his hands. Uh, anything else that you know, anybody wants to just throw out there real quick this week? With with that nice caveat, I, wanted to, I keep saying real quick. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll, we'll let you go, guys. We'll... Uh, um, so yeah, thanks thanks for joining us. So this all right. So thanks once again to Sky Matsuhashi. Thanks to the Rec Poker players. Uh, great discussion as always goes by really fast. Thanks again to Running Aces for being our official sponsor. Make sure you check out RecPokerTraining.com. We got a lot of information out there on uh, things that we're offering and links to different things. So check that out, including some of the endorsements we've had some for some great players, great content people. Uh, appreciate their kind words uh, on our website. So with that, uh, until next week, good luck on the felt.